Counselor Mejia, how are you? I'm great. Happy to be here with you all again. Really, I'm grateful for the opportunity to check in with my people. Even if it's only once a month, it always feels good to be in community um, with you all. And thank you, Pastor Hobbs, for stepping in to be my co-pilot this morning. It's always my great privilege and pleasure. Um, and so we want people to actually join this conversation and you guys can do that by calling in at 617-282-0685. 617-282-0685. If that number is busy, call 617-282-7794. Again, 617-282-7794. Finally, 617-265-2679. That's 617-265-267. And those are the three numbers you can call live to be able to engage the counselor. Uh, again, we're doing this every third Tuesday of the month, 11 a.m., exclusively here on the Boston Praise Radio and TV Network, our only at-large city council. We're so pleased and proud and support her as she supports us as we work together. So you also can write us at 670 Washington Street, Dorchester, Mass., 02124. Perhaps you're incarcerated or you don't have the ability to pick up the phone, but you have a question. And so... Um, you certainly can engage. You have a voice here on Boston Praise Radio, Owen TV Network. And I'm so pleased, Council, that you um, came through during your um, campaign, as so many people do. Um, many people post becoming elected. Um, they're not as engaged. They're not as accessible. Um, so I appreciate you being accessible post um, being elected. Yes, yes. You know, and that was really important me pastor hobbs because i know what it feels like to be used yeah um and then uh people just kind of come at you when they need you and then when you need them then you can't even find them and so for me running for office i was really intentional about that level of engagement because i I would always say in every campaign stop but i made is that i was tired of elected officials coming around my way knocking on my door asking me for their vote and then we wouldn't see them anymore and so i really wanted to be able to show what is possible when we stay in community with those that we serve yes. um, and continue to build yes. because then that way we can restore trust in, 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 in this process. And I think that that's what so many people have lost along the way. And, you know, one of the, uh, one, of the, the one person that I remember did this really well was uh, now Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Um, the seat that I occupy today was the one that she left behind. And she was one of the few elected officials that would come to every event that I hosted. Mm-hmm. Even when there would only be three or four cats in the room, she'd still come, right? <laughs> yes. Um, because she knew that the, the spaces that the groups that I was a part of were coordinating were really deeply rooted in the community. And so, and even whether people voted or not, she still wanted to hear from the constituents that she represented. And so she really set the stage in terms of what engagement is all about. And so for me... It's really, I, I want, I want, I want to lead with that in mind as being a, a, accessible to the people because I work for you, the people, right? Like that's the other thing that people need to recognize is that well, elected officials aren't, aren't doing you any favors by showing up to your events. That's their job. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. We're supposed to be in community with those that we serve. We're supposed to show up. Mm-hmm. You know what? That's what we're hired to do, and. I would not be doing a good job if I got an office and then never stepped foot out of it. You know, that would not be a good look. Well, we so appreciate it. You know, I want to, I know there's so much you want to engage in, but one of the things that I just want to publicly want again, also thank you for your advocacy with regard to the issue of making sure that returning citizens can exercise their right to vote is where uh, this ballot box initiative that you supported. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. I, I so appreciate that. And I so appreciate continuing to work with you and Sheriff Tompkins to make that a, re- right. a reality that right. before the next election here in the city of Boston, that that will actually be in place. Um, so I, I'm so pleased to really to work with you and continue to work with you that we don't let this, any traction uh, slide in this. And, and it just can't be temporary, right? We have to be, be able to build 
sustainable, um, put together systems that, that are going to outlive us, right? Yeah, outlive yeah. you and you, um, because that's how things end up falling by the wayside, is that you have people who are really excited about something, but then when, when um, leadership changes, yeah. the, then the things that they put in place don't get that attention. Yeah, so yes. I, I think it's really about putting something in place that's going to be part of the norm, that this is that every election, this is what it's going to look like. And, you know, Pastor Hobbs, a lot of the work that I did prior to running for office, you know, I used to do a lot of work in the education space, hmm. um, and we were uh, working in collaboration with a program called Family Matters out of the Sheriff's Department. Oh, yeah, department. I know that program. Um, and so my, uh, my organization had a seat at that table, hmm. and we were part of a consortium, hmm. and a lot of the work that we did um, was to help build that bridge between our loved ones who are incarcerated and the families who are out here mm -hmm. and, and ensuring that there's a level of connectivity and, and communication mm -hmm. um, because when our loved ones return, they need that safety net, right? And there's a lot of work that we need to do in the community around stigma. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work that my organization did was really focused on helping students who have loved ones who are incarcerated and making sure that their parents still feel connected. Mm -hmm. To their, their their children despite mm -hmm. um, their incarceration status and through that work we even created a survey um, with the Boston Public Schools asking parents for input about the things that they care about and I our organization partnered with the Sheriff's Department to solicit feedback from our incarcerated loved ones because just because they were incarcerated doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have a voice in their children's education right, right. and so we are really intentional about that level of engagement, even even within those circumstances. And so the voting piece of it is just another layer of wow. ensuring that our loved ones are able to amplify their voice and be heard and have the type of representation. Um, because once they get out, they're, it's, it's about their livelihood, mm -hmm. you know? That's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to tell you, you know, I don't know if I shared this with you before, but um, I was really pleased um, with some of the traction. Brother Eric, um, who is a returning citizen and works intimately with me, who I get my guidance from quite candidly with regard to advocating for um, returning citizens, is we have to get our leadership from the communities that we're, you know, trying to advocate for by those communities. And and so I appreciate, um, you know, his leadership. But he was able to get um, an interview on Channel 25. Um, the Boston Globe did some coverage with regard to, to the movement, you know, the effort that with the ballot box initiative, but um, the response from some of the comments that came on the Globe article, I mean, literally seven of them out of eight that were initially there were very discouraging with regard to people's perspectives. Feeling there's some people who were like, you know, why would you give people who are locked up, you know, the rights to be able to shape the society? Like, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I just couldn't. I was, I was, I was, I was so grieved by the attitude oh, yeah. of some people who were like, "Who cares about this population?" About the as many people who responded to this article, eight. That's how many people really care. I mean, so just, and I didn't respond to any of that. And somebody said to me that I actually should, as a teachable moment, for even other people who might embrace that kind of ignorance. Yeah. Well, you know, I um, one of the first things that I proposed when I um when I got into office was this whole idea of having safe sanctuary spaces, right, mm -hmm. for folks who are undocumented, particularly young people, students. And I got a lot of pushback. There was somebody who called my office and left a long, hateful voicemail about how I should go back to my country, that he was going to send Trump to get me, um, and that my mother was a criminal because my mother was once upon a time undocumented. Wow. Just a lot of wow. hate. Wow, yeah. So and... Cool. You know, this this weighed heavy to my heart, and so I um I took that voicemail and I laid underneath all of his hateful comments. I laid beautiful images that contradicted everything that he said, <laughs> and I re um I posted the I posted the video, um and I I called him out and uh, but and I did so in a way of calling him in <laughs> because. I, I invited him to be a part of the conversation in that we were going to, going to be things that we were not going to agree on, but doesn't necessarily mean you have to be disagreeable, right? Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, so I put it out into the universe, and it got some press, 
and, it, and the video went viral, literally, and um, he ended up calling my office again um, to apologize. Wow. Because he wanted me to know that he wasn't a hateful person, but I had to let him know that while he may perceive himself as not a hateful person, his actions were very much so. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, well, we're not going to be able to change anybody, right, right? Right. And so it's all in how we choose to experience what what hate comes our way. And we can recycle that hate mm -hmm. and use it as a teachable moment to help people understand Beautiful. a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but we are always in fight mode, Pastor Hobbs, <laughs> right? We're yes. fighting about everything and with everybody. Yeah. And so I try to do things in ways that call people in um, and not just calling them out because that way of functioning doesn't really function, right? Yeah. And so I have pity for people. Like, yeah. I, I, I felt sorry for this man yeah. who had so much hate in his heart. Yeah. And you know, I don't know if you ever saw that movie Up. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an animation movie, and one of, one of the characters is an elderly man who had lost his wife. Um, he didn't have a lot of friends. And that's who I thought of mm. when I heard his voice. Mm. I thought of this animated, this, this movie that I had seen, and I felt really bad for him. Sure. You know, and he's a, he's a veteran. Mm. Um, mm. And he has a lot of hate in his heart based on just the things that he's experienced mm. in his life. But I, I felt sorry for him mm -hmm. instead of being mean back. I just yeah. I embraced him because I knew he was alone. Wow, that's a that's that's beautiful. That 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 that's beautiful, and that's um that's good. Um, that's helpful to know. Kind of like as you said, we're fight mode all the time, and so I pick. I want to pick and choose my battles, and so I felt like I didn't. <laughs> I didn't really have the energy really to be able to try to like go back and say, well, no. But I think that's a great. That's an excellent alternative to how to be able to respond. Um, you know, that's helpful. Um, so thank you, thank you for. Sharing and and that. Pastor Hobbs, you know, like our initial response is to defend ourselves and you know i do defend myself and i pick my battles yeah, right yeah, yeah um but sometimes it's all in how you utilize your energy yeah and when you're dealing with people who have hate in their heart mm -hmm. um that's a whole different type of you know level of energy that you need to really be able to get to them in ways that are with you're leading with compassion and mm -hmm. sometimes people just want to be heard yeah um and they may not be so opposed to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, they just have never been heard, right? And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. just because they disagree with you, you could show them how to do it in a way that's a little bit more compassionate. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know? That's beautiful. Thank um, you for that. No, I think I, I think that this is what these, these times require. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we're always, you know, um, in, in, conflict, in constant conflict because that's how we function, mm -hmm. and I think that given what's happening on the national scale, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. even globally with racial and, and civil unrest, mm -hmm. you know, we have a pandemic on our hands. Mental health and wellness is, is an issue that, you know, being poor is traumatic enough. Yes. And now laying in with all of these things that we're experiencing right now, there's just people, a lot of hearts are, are heavy right now, and I think... Um, this God is giving us a moment. I mean, I'm not going to get too religious up in here, but, oh, you know, man. but I, I just really do believe that God is presenting us with a beautiful opportunity to really um, re-examine how we have been functioning um, and give us an opportunity to really see what it looks like when it says love thy neighbor, right? Like when we love mm -hmm. our neighbor, mm -hmm. COVID has presented itself as an opportunity for us to extend a hand out mm -hmm. and, and help others who may be in need, you know, mm -hmm. COVID has helped us understand that we're all the same. Yes. Um, and we're all experiencing, we might be experiencing things differently, but we're all experiencing the same things, right? Even the racial unrest that you see, all of this is that, all of this that's happening is happening for a reason. And if we don't, if we don't open up our hearts and if we don't, if we don't embrace this moment in time mm -hmm. to reset mm -hmm. we're just going to continue to go down a path of destruction and i think that this is the intervention this is the moment this is our reckoning right now this is like how we move how we treat each other is going to set the stage for the next 20 years and so i know this is bad but i do believe that there's a blessing here yes. in this in disguise and we need to 
be able to embrace it. I totally agree. Brother Eric Kennedy often says, I mean, I think it's so true um, that through this pandemic, we need to not just get through this pandemic, but grow through this pandemic. Yeah. I mean, there's something God's trying to get to and through get to and through us, you know, yeah. through this pandemic that we've got to realize, you know, that that uh, pay attention because there's no one that's exempt. The only protection, the only favor on that's going to come through is through um, ultimately the, the protection and the favor of God, quite candidly. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, this note that we're one family and who much is given, much is required. Like no one's exempt from this virus, from this, I mean, yeah. is from the White House to, uh, you know what I'm saying? No one's exempt. So and who much is given, much is required. And, and I'm yeah. curious with regard to the, you know, to the spikes and so forth. One of the things we're having a conversation with, um, um, with Pastor Wall and Brother Eric, with, with just with regard to black businesses and some of the, uh, we're seeing the PP. And I know you talked about this before. Um, how can people access resources who are our bodegas and businesses and nonprofits that yeah. want to be um, COVID compliant? All those petitions and the things yeah. that you need, like you know, how will people access those resources? Yeah. So we we um. Uh, Probably, I don't know, it was sometime in April or May, right when we learned that um, businesses were going to shut down, we, we learned that a lot of the high-touch um, groups, uh, businesses like bodegas and um, barbershops and hair salons um, were feeling that crunch. Mm -hmm. And I think um, more so the barbershops and hair salons because they're a high-touch industry, yeah. many of them were functioning, um, you know, with just cash only, yes. and as a result of that, um, and, and you know, when you have a class and a skill, yeah. you just know how to use it, and you don't, um, you don't have the, the skill set to, to the business, you just yeah. know the craft, yes. and so what we decided to do is through our code of relief fund, we partnered up with another group, um, uh, an organization to help us um, be able to support them, and so we um, created in partnership with a with a woman who does a lot of business management. She created a twelve hour uh, training program for COVID ready. Right, so mm. I adhering to the state guidelines, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. all the COVID readiness um, details. Um, and as well as the best practices, and then she also created um, an opportunity to teach them about how to have a cashless business, right, so that you're not touching any cash, everything is done um, through a cashless, uh, you know, apparatus, whether it would be through Cash App, or whatever, all these different yeah. ways for you to be able to uh, service your customers without having to exchange cash. Mm -hmm. um, and then also business essentials, right, a lot of these businesses didn't even know how, um, they didn't even have any internet presence. They didn't know how to utilize social media. So um, really helping organizations and businesses like these be able to thrive beyond um, COVID was the goal. And so um, you can see this program, about 60 um, businesses applied, and I think we <coughs> ended up training like 40 of those businesses. And post the, the training, after the training, they receive technical assistance as well as PPE, um, three months supply of PPE. We partnered up with BECMA and were able to help support them. And we also um, were able to provide small mini grants uh, to these uh, businesses, the ones that completed the training and continue to engage. Wow. wow. So, you know, being really intentional about. You know, we can't, it's, the, the city's big, um, but we've been, a lot of the work that has come out of my office, um, because I'm the chair of small business, hmm. has been hyper-focused on black and brown businesses, mm -hmm. um, being unapologetic about who we serve because we know who has been, who has been underserved for far too long, right? Mm -hmm. And understanding what lane we have and how we can help support businesses, um, just based on the relationships that we have. So we were able to do that, and, and to, to be honest, most of the businesses that completed the training, now they've built a coalition within themselves, right? And so they're informing us about 
what else they need hmm. to be able to, to thrive, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is part of the work, and that is how you know that we're making an impact because people are building relationships even within themselves, right? And so they're supporting each other, and then they continue to stay connected to our, our office, and we're able to provide them immediate information that comes out of the, wherever we get information about um, grants, opportunities, you know, uh, equipment, we're able to be an information hub for them, right? And so I think those are the sort of things that we've been building um, to help support small businesses. And the next wave of the work for our offices, we're going to start looking into workforce development. There are a lot of folks who are doing business in the city of Boston, but they're not doing business with people who live in Boston. And so we're going to be focusing a lot of our efforts on around workforce development and making sure that we create um, an ecosystem where, because um, th- what I hear everywhere that I go and every hearing that I'm in is that they don't have talent, but they don't have black and brown people, and that's why, we, that's why the numbers are the way that they are. And I refuse to find that to be offensive when you say to me that you all can't find qualified black and brown people to do these jobs. And so uh, one of the areas of focus in our office for our next year, you know, we've only been in office for 10 months, so, you know, but next year, our focus is going to, um, we're going to be looking into workforce development issues. Wow, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm multitasking here. Um, I'm okay. um, um, so, so are, no, no, no. are there more yeah. places for people to be able to access those resources? So, the, so the people I'm saying, so the initial group that went through it, can more people access it, or is that finished? Um, so people who might now want to be able to access that training and or the PPE or need the plastic, you know, partitions within their place. Um, how? Can, yeah, is it so we could. They, they can definitely reach out to my office. Unfortunately, the the the. Those resources um, were allocated and set aside for the folks who participated in the training earlier this summer, and that was part of their uh, agreement is that if they completed the training fully, that then they would have access to these very specific sets of resources, like the many grants that we were we've been able to give away, and the and the um, and the PPE. However, we're more than happy to share with folks other resources that may exist in ways that they may be able to be able to get access to them. Okay. So, so they would, they would, you would encourage people to, um, to call your office? I mean, and yeah, they can definitely, they should email my office. It's Julia, J-U-L-I-A dot M as in Mary, E as in Edward, J as in Jolly, I as in Eagle, A as in Apple. Mm-hmm. So that's Julia dot Mejia at Boston dot gov. Awesome. And they should put on the subject line, mm-hmm. um, business support or PPE mm-hmm. support mm-hmm. and then I have a director of external affairs who can put them in touch with other groups because what we've secured has already been um, earmarked for those folks who completed the training that was part of their agreement understood so we do have access to information um, and, and and opportunities that come through our door, if you will, that we would be able to, that we can include them in the email distribution list that we have to share information and resources that are coming out. That's incredible. I mean, um, even here at Boston Praise, I mean, Pastor and I were talking again, so we, we, you know, we're wearing the mask and we're doing the six foot um, social distancing. We're, you know, doing the cleaning and the stir and the disinfecting, um, you know, the minimum, minimal people within the studio at a time. And so those kinds of things that we're doing. But one of the things that we were looking at most recently is even with that said, like I see those plastic partitions um, and we were thinking even within the studio being able to have even though we're distant and so forth, but to have an additional layer, you know, is maybe having some of those plastic partitions um, throughout the studio. So I know that's something that we, even as a nonprofit faith-based organization, um, media um, are, are looking to be able to try to get, um, to, you know, to explore uh, resources to be able to pay for that kind of um, COVID compliant um, resources. Yeah, absolutely. So go ahead and send our office an email. We'll um we'll share it with you whatever details we get. Okay. Um, because sometimes it's about access and, and information sharing, right? There's lots of resources out there. I always say that Boston is resource rich, yes. but coordination poor. Yes. And so there, there's just so much out there. Just people don't have access to information. So yes. you know, conversations like this 
can help connect people who, who are listening or even yourselves that are like, oh, wow, I didn't even know that this exists. So yeah. it's about, that's not our job. Our job is to connect people to the resources that are available to them. And yes. that's the work of your counselor, y'all. <laughs> y'all got to understand. We, we, y'all, they know what is doing you all any favors when they're doing their job, period. Thank you. Again, the email address it again is? Yeah, it's Julia dot m-e-j-i-a at boston.gov that's julia um dot mejia at boston.gov and people can also follow me we share a lot of information on our social plat- social media platform mm-hmm. so people should follow us at julia for boston that's julia f-o-r boston mm-hmm. julia for boston is another way that they can um connect with all of the information because we we're actually hosting a COVID town hall oh wow um Saturday um, from 12 to 2, they can just log on to our Facebook page. Um, we're going to do a state of affairs, mm. like, you know, what are people thinking and feeling as a result of, like, the uptick in um, COVID cases mm-hmm. and how that's making an impact on our, on the economy, the edu- you know, education, our social and emotional well-being and racial inequities that we uh, see. So that we're hosting that on um, this Saturday from um, 12 to 2. This Saturday from 12 to 2. Mm-hmm. Wow. Brother Terrence Ephraim Gray Sr., um, one of our brothers who tunes in faithfully from Baltimore, is saying, how can Baltimore help Julia's re-election? And where <laughs> can we get to get, where can we go to, to get information? And does yeah. she have any plans to run for mayor or governor in Boston? <laughs> Well, you know, it's so funny because everybody's been like, "What are you running for mayor?" <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, for me, I'm, I'm an exponential learner, so I'm learning my job as a city councilor at large. Yes. First, yes. I really want to learn the ins and outs because I really want to be of service, right? And yes. so, um, I, I'm, I'm focusing on winning again next year because I can't believe I didn't even get comfortable in my seat and I got to already defend it next year. Next year? Um, yeah, next year I run again. It's crazy. Wow. Um. So I have to fight for my life again next year. And then, you know, I feel like in the next few, I, 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 whoever runs for mayor this time, they better not get too comfortable in that seat because I'm coming for it. All right. All right. That's Good it. for you. So you, you're, you're saying that right now. Oh, that, I mean, I, I do believe that God has a plan for me. Amen. Um, and, it, and I'm not running this year. I just want to be really clear. I'm yeah, not running yeah, this year. Yeah. I'm, running in, I'm running in the next the next. The next mayoral race, if God gives me life. And, Amen. You know, Good for you. Um, but I really want to learn my job. I really want to be able to. I feel like I got four more years of really learning City Hall, mm-hmm. learning the function, learning how to do the work, understanding where all the opportunities exist to really move people out of poverty. Mm-hmm. You know, I really want to have a good command of what the work is mm-hmm. so that when I apply for the job, mm-hmm. if you will, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm better suited. I'm not going to apply for something that I can't do. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I still have a lot to learn before I jump into that seat. That's incredible. That's incredible. So do you think that Boston, I mean, I mean, it's a rhetorical question, but do you think that I mean, Boston has never had a mayor of a, a woman, a woman be the mayor of the city of Boston or a person of color? And so you genuinely believe that Boston is ready and, and needs to, to have to, to, to burst through both of those uh, ceilings? Well, see, the thing is, too, is that right now in this current uh race, you have options of two women who yes. could potentially become the first. So I probably, if either of them win, I won't be the first. Um, but I'll be the second. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. Um, and I'll be the first. I'll be the first Afro Latina. So I'll be the first something. But but do you think um, Boston? But do you think Boston is? I mean, do you think that Boston, even if it's even one of the two people who are, are applying now, do you think Boston is really ready to elect a person of color or a woman to that office? Yeah, I think that Boston, if we don't flex our political muscle right now mm-hmm. and mobilize communities of color, mm-hmm. um, we'll, we'll never be ready. I don't know. I can't. I know that I need to win by one. You know, the more than one vote. Yes. So I'm going to focus on my citywide race. Yes. But I will say this. Yes. If they're not ready for them now, I know they will be by the time I'm ready to go. <laughs> it's time. It's it's past time. It, it's it's absurd it is. To, it to me that this but is... But it's about, you know, it's, it's a lot of things, right? Yeah. I feel like, I feel like 
that's why it's so important for me to learn my job and to really have a good command of it because I don't want to set myself up or my people up to fail. Yeah. And I want to be really honest about what I can and cannot do. Mm-hmm. But I do believe that the, 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 the people are thirsty for, for a leadership that is reflective of lived experience. And being a person of color is just, ha- it's just a portion of the requirement, mm-hmm. right? Unless you have lived that way, mm-hmm. and if you, you, know, you understand the profound lived experiences of mm-hmm. being a person of color in the city of Boston, mm-hmm. then it's just another check mark, right? Mm-hmm. I just feel like lived experience cannot be um, downplayed. I think that that's going to be so important, is your lived experience. Absolutely. 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 I, I, and then if anybody wants to support my efforts, they can, um, to uh, the listener from Baltimore, uh, I, we do have a website. It's juliaforboston.com, juliaforboston.com. Um, and you could link up there and see what we're up to and, or follow us on our, show, on our social media. We're really active and, and, um, and engaging folks. Our job is to help bring people into the conversation and create space for folks who are living the realities and that's what our office is really good at so if people have any ideas or questions or concerns or comments and they want to um, share them with us you know please um, feel free to engage with us in any way that feels right for you we really do appreciate this opportunity to um, spend some time with you all once a month I'm in connecting and Pastor Hobbs you've done such a great job with um, engaging me these past 30 minutes and I really am grateful for you to um, not just letting me babble by my first <laughs> for 30 minutes. You, you, I was having a lot of anxiety about like, oh my God, I can't, I can't talk for 30 minutes just about blah, blah, blah. So you've done such an amazing job. So You're hopefully kind. we can do this next time and if yes. questions come up or themes or, you know, if you could, if folks can, if there's a particular theme that you want me to focus on, I mean, next month is Christmas and the holidays. I'd love to spend a little bit of time sharing whatever resources come down our pathway, ways that people can, you know, get gifts and things like that. So I'll have my office put together a list of resources that I can share with folks oh, wow. when I meet again. That would be great. Again, I'm um, Counselor. Thank you. And also know that on next month, um, in fact, on today, uh, State Representative Nikki Alugardo was going to be with us. But unfortunately, she had a fall and yes. uh, she's recovering not as quickly as she would have liked. So please, one, everybody keep her in your prayers. We are so proud of her. She's doing a great work. But she will be with us next month um, right prior to you. So every third Tuesday of the month, it will be both uh, uh, State Representative Nikki Algardo and you um, engaging the community. So we look forward to next month. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful holiday. Um, take care. Make sure everybody wears their masks. Don't congregate with large groups and, and take care of yourself, okay? Thank you, counselor. Okay. God bless. Thank you so much. You Thank will. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. From within, haunted by a power that cannot see past my skin. My views are viewed as ignorant, my truth always denied. My history is shrouded in a spider web of lies. Isn't this America? Is this America all alive? I'm a freedom of speech.